Well, good morning, uh, 915, people at 915. It's so great to be with you all. Uh, so great to see many of you join online and so many of you in the chapel right now. It's a privilege to open up God's word for us today. Uh, well, brothers and sisters, this Sunday marks the beginning of entering well into the Christmas season. You know, December reminds us of many things. For most of us, it's wrapping up work before the holiday or preparing for the next year. For some of us, it's clamoring to buy presents for all the family and friends. And for some, it's looking forward to snagging some sweet deals and sales on Boxing Day. And for many of the uni students, it's looking forward to seemingly boundless free time. But for us here who come to CCC, who call ourselves Christians, who go to church, December reminds many of us of the classic month-long block of sermons about Christmas. If you've been at church for a while, you'll know that December is marked by sermons on the Christmas message, the reason for the season, as many call it. But nevertheless, each year we come to a point where we can cast our eyes and see the great joy we as Christians have in the goodness of our God, who gave us his one and only son, Jesus. It's a wonderful time for many of us to return afresh to the gospel message. And so in the spirit of the Christmas sermon block, the pastoral team have decided to look at the Christmas message at a slightly different angle through Christmas carols. Many of you know already this series is titled News Worth Singing About. And so we're going to be looking at Christmas carols, carols which some of us may know and love, carols that are rich with biblical truth about the birth of Jesus Christ, and carols that talk about its meaning, about its significance for us. So from today through the end of the year, Sunday sermons will be inspired by the music of Advent and Christmas. Each sermon will be rooted, as always, in scripture, but they'll be drawing from the lyrics of a seasonally appropriate hymn or a carol or song. And so now it's our hope and prayer that this isn't merely just a fresh new take on Christmas sermons, but rather a way for us to set our hearts towards God during this Christmas time and, and further appreciate the doctrines and the meanings behind some of these great carols. And so with all that being said, how about we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for Christmas. We thank you that Christmas is a time for us to cast our minds back to when Jesus came into the world to fulfill your promises, to deliver your plan of salvation and to redeem your people. Lord, we pray now and through this whole series that you would open our hearts and minds to know the goodness of Jesus's first coming and to long for his second coming. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so today's sermon is titled after one of the most popular Advent hymns, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. This hymn, originally composed in Latin, is one of the oldest hymns that we actually know of. So if you're young, um, it's probably no surprise that this hymn is not familiar to you at all. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually have it played once so that we can familiarize with the song as well as digest some of the lyrics. And hopefully after which some of you who might not know the song might recognize it. Thanks, Daniel.
dark shadow put to the light. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to the old It's a beautiful song, isn't it? Now, having listened to the song, uh, I don't want you all thinking that all that we're going to do is expound carols and songs for the whole month and not spend any time in God's word. After all, it is the business of the pulpit to expound the word of God, to preach the word of God. So perhaps it's appropriate that I pause for a bit and give you some explanation as to what we're going to do in this series. You see, there's three things in particular that we want to do. The first thing is we want to understand the beautiful poetry of the familiar words of the carols that we sing or the carols that we hear year after year. We want to understand them better. Perhaps Christmas carols are among some of the songs that we sing the most frequently or the ones that we have the most memorized. At least the first stanza of many of our familiar Christmas carols, we might know off by heart. And, you know, when you know a song off by heart, one of the temptations you have is to sing it without ever thinking once that you're singing it to the Lord. And so hopefully by giving some time to understand exactly the significance of the beautiful poetry in these carols, hopefully we will enrich our worship of the living God as we worship Sunday after Sunday. 
Secondly, however, we want these carols to serve as windows onto the biblical stories. These carols, most of them, they're designed to poetically express truths, uh, especially out of uh, the gospels about the birth of Jesus and its significance for us as his redeemed people. And so we want to use these carols as windows onto that glorious redemptive story. But more than that, and thirdly, we want the scriptures to illuminate the particular poetic expressions of biblical truth that we sing in these carols. We not only want to understand the words better, we not only want to use the carols to serve as windows onto the biblical story, but thirdly, and most importantly, we want our understanding of what God says in scripture to enrich the songs that we lift up to him when we sing songs of worship, when we sing these carols. We want scripture to enrich them. And so what we're going to do is we're going to examine each of the stanzas of this carol. I'm using the word stanza because I don't want to confuse us with the word verses because we'll be looking at heaps of verses from the Bible. So we're going to look and examine each stanza and see how it illuminates the truths in Scripture. So starting off with the first stanza. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns and lonely exile here until the son of god appear here we have a stanza which is set in the mind of the people of israel centuries ago while they waited for the messiah but the first we want to look at is the word emmanuel after all this name is repeated in almost every refrain so we're going to take a look at this name from one of, from one of the passages that was read out to us isaiah 7 and we're looking at verses 13 to 14 then isaiah said here now you house of david it is, not, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now, to put this in context, as the history of Israel, God's chosen nation, as the history of Israel continues to develop and their idolatrous sin only grows more and more profane, it seems that God's presence is totally withdrawn from his people, totally withdrawn. And however, in the midst of the chaos of their sin and the apparent absence of God, there is this little prophetic whisper in the book of Isaiah that points to a day when God will be near once again. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now we see its promise fulfilled in Matthew 1, to 23, which is also read out. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, don't worry too much about the spelling of Emmanuel, the E and the I. They're just spelling differences between the Hebrew and the Greek. But what it translates into is what's important. It translates into God with us. So in the very first line, we read of a people who are calling for this Emmanuel to come. And in the next three lines, we actually see the state in which these people are in. So let's turn to Psalm 137, 1 to 4. It's going to be on the screen again. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our harps. For there, our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? This passage speaks of Israel's mourning and their longing for the presence of God. As punishment for their disobedience, their idolatrous sin, the people of Israel were exiled from the presence of God. Israel was carried into exile to Babylon. And we can see their weeping and their longing for the presence of God. Their longing for God to redeem them and ransom them from their captors to return to their land in the presence of God. And so in these lines of the first stanza, we see a faithful remnant of God's people. They're longing, they're groaning, they're yearning. You can hear it in the language of, oh, come, oh, come. This is the O oh of longing, not merely to just return to the land, but ultimately for God to dwell once again in their presence. They call upon this Emmanuel to come. They call upon this promise of hope to come, to take them out of captivity, out of exile. Next stanza. O come thou day spring from on high, and cause thy light on us to rise. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadow. 
put to flight. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Here we have a stanza that talks about light and darkness, and the Bible often uses language and motifs of light and darkness, but let's turn the, to the passage that this stanza actually draws upon. It's Luke uh, 1, 76 to 79, and this passage is about the foretelling of the birth of John the Baptist. So it reads, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of the salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our, way, uh, our feet into the way of peace. So this passage speaks of a prophecy made by Zechariah, John the Baptist's father. He prophesies about his son, John, who will be a prophet preparing the way for Jesus. And in verse 78, it's sunrise. It means the dawn or the day spring, the beginning of the day. The sun rises above the horizon. It ends the night. It ends the darkness and it brings in a whole new day. It's a poetic expression for, at the time, what Christ is going to do when he comes. He will end the darkness and he'll bring in a new day of light. There's more of this language of light and darkness. Take a look at Colossians 1 with me. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy, of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Now, in this passage, the word dominion carries with it the meaning of dominance, of control, of rule, a power that's absolute. And that dominion is that of darkness. And here, darkness refers to the, the realm of sin and evil and all the wretchedness and brokenness that comes with it. And so, in essence, everyone is trapped in this dominion of darkness. There is an almost hopelessness to this darkness. But if you look at Colossians 1, it tells us that there is one incredible way out. It's by being rescued by Christ who redeemed us and forgave us of our sins. And then in the next line, in the refrain, we see this shift in this tone. It's a shift away from the language of longing and uh, of yearning and towards a picture of joyfulness, of rejoicing. We read, rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. It's a hopeful jubilation. Rejoice for Emmanuel, God with us, shall come to you, O Israel. You can see that each stanza is filled with expressions of deep longing for Jesus. But at the close of each stanza, there is this hopeful jubilation of joy in knowing that there is an Emmanuel that will bring both God and his people together. Now, the next three stanzas are written slightly different to the previous two. Uh, it's not in the structure or the composition, but actually in the content. You see, the first two stanzas, they spoke in anticipation of the coming of Jesus, in his carnation through uh, the virgin birth. And they were written to express the perspective of those people who were in Old Testament scripture, those in redemptive history who were anticipating the coming of Jesus for the first time. Now, the next three stanzas, however, on the right side of that graphic there, the next three stanzas are actually an expression of anticipation from our perspective of those who know and, and can hear about Jesus and are awaiting his second return. These three stanzas are super rich with biblical truths that are scattered throughout scripture. And so we'll pace through these slightly faster than the first two. And then after that, I'd like to spend some time considering a few points of reflection from this carol as we consider Christmas. Stanza three. O come, O come, true prophet of the Lord, and turn the key to heaven's door. Be thou our comforter and guide and lead us to the Father's side. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall by his word our darkness dispel. Now, you'll notice in the first line of each stanza, Jesus is given some sort of title. It's either Emmanuel or it's Dayspring. And the next three, the following three, they speak of Jesus as the prophet, as the priest, and as the king. Now, prophet, priest, and king is commonly called as Jesus' threefold office, who he is and what he did and, and what he does right now. And in the third stanza here, he's described as the true prophet. 
But, you know, interestingly enough, this stanza here focuses a lot on the Holy Spirit. Let's take a look. Any study of the Gospels will show us that Jesus was considered a prophet during his lifetime on earth. Jesus reveals to us that he is the way to the Father. He points to himself as the only avenue through whom we can have reconciliation to God. He preached that the kingdom of God was at hand in himself. He taught that all of the Old Testament hopes and dreams of God's salvation were just about to be realized. And in John 15 here, everything that he has learned from the Father, he has made known to us. Not only that, but in Hebrews 12, we know that he still speaks to us now. You know, it's through the Bible and faithful servants, the preachers and teachers of his church, and all of it ultimately through the working of the Holy Spirit. Although Jesus is the true prophet, it is by the inner workings of the Holy Spirit, which we can come and understand the word of God. The next line in this stanza, stanza three, refers to a key, the key to heaven's door. In the Old Testament in Isaiah, we see that the keys to the kingdom, the keys to the house of David, are placed on the shoulders of Eliakim. And it ultimately is fulfilled in Jesus. Later in Matthew, in the New Testament, Jesus says to Peter that he will give him the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, these keys aren't suggesting that there is a physical door that uh, needs to be opened, obviously, but it refers to the means of which one can enter the kingdom, the means of which one can enter the kingdom. And that's through the gospel message, through the teachings of Jesus. It's the teaching that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life, and that only through him we have access to the Father. You know, that truth, when it is faithfully proclaimed and in combination with the workings of the Holy Spirit, it opens the kingdom into people's lives. So you see, this stanza actually calls upon the pr true prophet and asks him with the Holy Spirit to move and to work so that the kingdom can be opened up in people's hearts so that they can believe, so that the keys to heaven's door can be opened to them. Now, hopefully you're beginning to see just how rich with Bible truths these poetic expressions are in this carol. The next line speaks of the comforter and the guide, which many of us know are titles for the Holy Spirit. In these two passages from John 14 and 16, we see that the advocate or the comforter in other translations, it serves to teach and remind us of all things that Jesus has said and will guide us into all the truths. And then the next line, it seems fairly straightforward, lead us to the Father's side. But again, this is actually talking about the Holy Spirit leading us to Jesus. If you have a look at John 1, 18, Jesus is the one who sits at the Father's side. So this line, again, calls God the Holy Spirit to lead us to Jesus, to point us towards Emmanuel, who sits at the Father's side. And then the refrain in stanza three nicely summarizes that through Jesus, by the word of God, we will never be in darkness. That by following Emmanuel, the light of the world in John 8, we will never walk in darkness. By his word, our darkness dispel. In stanza four, the next stanza, we see a concise summary of the gospel through the priestly work of Jesus. O come, our great high priest, and intercede thy sacrifice, our only plea. The judgment we no longer fear, thy precious blood has brought us near. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel has banished every fear of hell. Many of us know that Jesus is our great high priest who intercedes for us, who constantly is praying for us. And he's also our great high priest because he made the perfect sacrifice. He made a sacrifice which was once for all, an all-sufficient and all-satisfying sacrifice in Hebrews 7. It was unlike any other imperfect priestly sacrifice which needed to be repeated over and over again. It was once for all. And it's because of this sacrifice that there is no fear in the judgment to come. Because in knowing that Jesus has sacrificed himself for us, in 1 John 4, the love of God has been made complete in us, giving us full confidence on the day of judgment. We need not have any fear in judgment. And it is this sacrifice, this sacrifice, which Christ did so by shedding his blood for us. Ephesians 2, it says, it is through the precious blood that we can be brought near once again to God. 
How beautiful is that? In the refrain, we sing once again of the joy that we have in Emmanuel, in Jesus, because he has removed all fear of hell. He is our great high priest whose sacrifice is complete and is perfect, and he continues to intercede for us. He has banished every fear of hell. And finally, our last stanza, which serves as a culmination of our eager expectation of Jesus' return. O come, thou king of nations bring an end to all our suffering. Bid every pain and sorrow cease and reign now as our prince of peace. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come again with us to dwell. We call Jesus our king of nations, the one that resides over all other nations and all other kings, the king of kings. In the well-known Revelation 21, we call our king to come and put an end to all the suffering, all the pain and sorrow that we face in this world. And then we petition this king, this king Jesus, to return, to come and reign as our prince of peace, the one that was prophesied all the way back in Isaiah 9.6. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then in the final refrain, we rejoice in the knowledge that when Jesus returns, God's dwelling place will be amongst his people, where God will be with them and be their God. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come again with us to dwell. Well, friends, well, brothers and sisters, hopefully through examining this carol very closely, you were just overwhelmed with the sheer richness of biblical truth that saturates this Christmas carol. You know, it's so potent with the hopes and the yearnings of God's people that were written throughout scripture. But, you know, this Christmas carol is more than just a, a song that's steeped in biblical theology. It's actually a Christmas carol that almost perfectly expresses our lives right now as we live on this side of the cross. You know, because O Come, O Come, Emmanuel serves both as a prayer for the first and for the second coming of Jesus. It takes us into the mind of old Israel, longing for the first coming of the Messiah. And it goes beyond that longing by voicing the yearning of the church of Christ now. For the Messiah, for Jesus Christ to come and fulfill the promise of his return. In Matthew 1, when Emmanuel arrives, when the day spring rises, and when he comes to live as a man, to sacrifice his life, and to die for the sins of all mankind, for the sins of you and I, you know, we take great joy in our redemption. But we also learn that redemption has only just begun. Now, make no mistake that, you know, the final blood is shed, the debt is paid, forgiveness is purchased, God's wrath is removed, adoption is secured. You know, the down payment is in the bank, the future is sure, the joy is great, but the end is not yet. Death still snatches away. Disease still makes us miserable. That has been increasingly evident this year, hasn't it, with COVID? Calamity still strikes. Satan still prowls around the corner. Flesh still wars against the spirit. Sin still indwells within us. And we still groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. We still wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. We still wait for final deliverance from the wrath to come. We still wait for the hope of righteousness. The longing continues. You know, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel isn't quite, like, isn't quite like Christmas tunes like Joy to the World, Angels We've Heard on High, or Hark the Air Old Angels Sing. It's not exuberant and jovial like those, which is, you know, it's fine, mind you. They have their own right and true place. But the carol that we examined here, it's mournful and it's contemplative. The mood is that of longing, of aching, of yearning, of hoping. You know, John Piper described it quite well when reflecting on this particular carol. He says, the Christian life oscillates between these two poles, the overflowing joy of the already redeemed and the tearful yearning of the not yet redeemed. Not that we ever leave one or the other in this life. We are sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. It is good to have Christmas carols that capture both dimensions of Christian life. You know, I'm sure that as we close in on Christmas, as we move 
closer to Christmas, there are going to be some Christians that will inevitably experience some sadness and sorrow, especially at the end of a year like 2020. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that Christmas cannot be filled with cheerful spirits and joyful merriness. No, by, by all means, we should celebrate Christmas by remembering that Jesus came into this world, that he was born to fulfill prophecy, to dwell with God's people and to save and redeem them. But let's not make the mistake that Christmas must always be all jolly and all jingle bells. Let's remember that the longings which the people of God had before Jesus was born and the longings for us as well as we await his return. And so with every stanza, we sing with longing and yearning. We pour our hearts out in our reflection on the brokenness of this world and the sin that pervades this life on earth. But, you know, at the end of every stanza, we can remind ourselves of the confidence and of the joy that we have in the certainty of Jesus' return and all the promises that come with it. And so as we reflect and contemplate the meaning of and significance of not just this Christmas carol, but this Christmas season, I want to encourage you to consider what do you long for in Jesus' return? What do you long for? In Jesus's return. You know, there is so much that goes on during Christmas time, isn't there? There's so much going on. It would be an utter waste to simply go through the motions, through the secular Christmas traditions, and not use Christmas as a reminder of the promise of Jesus's return. Let me encourage you to find time to break through all the commotion that usually surrounds Christmas festivities and pause and reflect on what you are most looking forward to when Jesus returns. What is it? Is, is it the renewed bodies? Is it seeing fellow believers? Is it everlasting peace? Is it restoration of this world? Is it, is it singing praises amongst a multitude of different tongues? Or is it the absence of pain? Is it the absence of sorrow? Is it the absence of sin? Is it being able to dwell in the presence of God and Jesus our Savior? What are you longing for? What are you yearning, waiting, or aching for in the coming return of Jesus? As we long for the second coming of Emmanuel, there is much we cannot understand about our world. We cannot fathom why the innocent suffer, why evil has such opportunity, why God does not just make things better right now. But in our perplexity, in our confusion, we do know something that keeps us going, something that strengthens us in the midst of sorrow and confusion. We know that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. In our pain and puzzlement, God is with us. In our sadness and our yearning, God is with us. In doubt and fear, God is with us. Through Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit, God is with us. And not just with us, but for us, beside us, before us, behind us, within us, and amongst us. So we are comforted. Even as we sing with deep longing, we are comforted when we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that we have the promise that Emmanuel will come. We give thanks that while we face the trials and troubles of life in this world, we can still fix our eyes and set our hearts on the coming of the Lord Jesus, our day spring, our true prophet, our great high priest, and our king of nations, our Emmanuel. We thank you. And we pray that you'll help us to consider and reflect upon the many promises that are assured to us in the coming of Jesus. Help us to reflect upon that this Christmas. We thank you for his death and his resurrection by which we can all be saved. And we pray in his name. Amen.